to shed more light on the Indian Army on the path to be an agile, transformative, and self-reliant force, please join us in welcoming on stage the Chief of the Army Staff, General Manoj Pandey. A big round of applause. He is going to be joined in conversation with Group Editor-in-Chief, Navika Kumar. Thank you, Meghna. Thank you, Deepti. And thank you, General Manoj Pandey, for uh, gracing this occasion where we are talking about India Unstoppable, led uh, by an army, an Indian army that we are so proud of. I want to today begin with uh, asking you on what is that, uh, what is it about India that makes it unstoppable and uh, how is the army really doing what it does, what we are so proud of in terms of making a difference to this story of India. Right, firstly, thank you for having me here. No, I see uh, Indian Army as a key contributor and a stakeholder in the nation's rise. I believe uh, nation's progress and security are inextricably linked. While the economic progress is the fountainhead of growth, I think it is the military strength that lends it the capability uh, to be able to uh, address ongoing as well as future security challenges. So let me say, in terms of our commitment uh, to make sure uh, that India's growth story is not impeded in any manner because of the security trend. That commitment is uh, absolutely unwavering. You also ask, as an army, what, why? So let me try and define as an institution, what is it that defines uh, the Indian Army? Firstly, I think it's a microcosm of values that us all citizens look up to in our uh, society. Secondly, uh, it is our core values which are built on the edifice of Nam Namak Nishan. Third is uh, our unwavering commitment towards motherland. And that is again exemplified well in a part of the Chetwodian motto which says that the safety, honor and welfare of the country comes first, uh, always and every time. Then there is aspect of secularism wherein within the army uh, we have soldiers from different religions, ethnicities, different regions working together and that is part of our, integral part of our uh, character if I may. So these are some of the issues as to what defines us. As also, if you look at unity and diversity, we have uh, soldiers from different states, different religions, different languages, we all work together as a cohesive force. You also mentioned about the faith uh, that the citizens have. And why is that? I think it is because of the selfless commitment of our soldiers that they see in terms of protecting our borders, getting deployed in the various internal uh, security situations. It is also because of the sacrifices that our soldiers are ready to make. It is the confidence that the citizens have in our combat experience, in our training, the equipment that we have. That is another factor why uh, people have faith uh, or repose faith in the Indian Army. And they also see as part of the national integration, here is an organization or institution which again exemplifies national integration. So what I wish to say is it is because of these factors that uh, our soldiers or the Indian Army has created a special place in the mind space of our citizens. And it is their trust, it is their faith and confidence reposed in us that only strengthens our resolve further. And I'm confident that on the basis of our character, our values, and our total professionalism, I think 
we are able to meet the expectations and the aspirations of the citizens of this country. Very well said. Uh, but General Bande, recent conflicts, whether in Russia, Ukraine or Israel, Hamas conflict, uh, there are some lessons that have been thrown up. Wars are clearly not as fast and swift and devastating. It is uh, uh, the manner in which these wars have come up that has made us uh, look at uh, some of the lessons that uh, come out of this. How are we taking these lessons and how are we adapting ourselves to the technological prowess uh, that is a, a very important feature in some of these wars? You're, you're very right. Uh, I think there are very profound lessons that we can learn from the ongoing conflicts that are happening around us. And these are at each level, be it the strategic level, the operational level, all the tactical or the functional level. So maybe at the strategic level, I think one of the most important takeaways for us is to become self-reliant. We saw it during the pandemic, we saw it during the recent conflict situations. Our import de dependencies have to become near zero. I think the second important lesson is where national interests are involved, countries will not hesitate to go to war. So the salience of national security in the international system is something, again, has been, I would feel, uh, re-established or revalidated. Third is in terms of uh, the relevance of land forces. Because we have disputed, contested borders, I think the salience of land forces will remain in terms of victory markers. Again, victory markers will be decided, in my view, uh, in the land domain. There are also aspects of uh, technology, and you mentioned. So it is no longer the conventional combat superiority conventional platforms that will determine victory in the future, but you have niche disruptive critical technologies that we saw. Uh, to give examples, you have the unarmed vehicles, you have manned unmanned teams, you have uh, activities in the cyber domain. In fact, influence operation, the battle of narratives, I think these are the areas which are outside the conventional domains of warfare. These are becoming increasingly important uh, in the future and hence the importance of how quickly and how efficiently we are able to leverage these technologies which are available within the country in the commercial world. There is also this aspect of gray zone warfare. So we understand gray zone uh, in different domains, of, let's say economic activity, diplomatic activity, but the gray zone activities in the military domain, be it the land, air, or the maritime domain, are as important. So we need to strategize as to how do you deal with these challenges in the gray zone? How do we strategize to have an effective uh, sort of gray zone strategy? And there are other lessons at the tactical levels in terms of uh, the larger weapon platforms. How do you incorporate small teams and the rest of it? So all these lessons we need to pick up, but we have to be careful that we need to see as to how relevant are these lessons in our context. Well, uh, Atma Nirbharta. Atma Nirbharta is an important uh, strategy. It's an important initiative. And very recently, we did see the Bharat Shakti Expo, uh, where the Prime Minister talked about the growing Atma Nirbhar Shakti uh, that uh, we in India are developing. Having said that, for the layperson, many people often wonder whether in today's cutting edge technology world, are we somewhere or the other compromising on our uh, strategic requirements with Atmanirbharta or has uh, domestic manufacturing and domestic innovations uh, actually been able to keep pace uh, with the technological developments in the field of defense? How do you see this uh, entire uh, balance, uh, so to speak? So let me mention to begin with about exercise Bharat Shakti, which we recently did in the, uh, Pokhran. And the aim was to demonstrate our ongoing efforts and initiatives towards capability development through Atmanirbharta. 
it was also an opportunity for us to showcase the robustness, the reliability, and the effectiveness of indigenous systems that are currently in service. And I think we were able to do that uh, to great satisfaction. I mentioned uh, about the necessity to become self-reliant. In fact, I would go a step ahead and describe it as a strategic imperative for the future. It is not only for conventional platforms. Often we mistake Atmanirbharta or to become self-reliant in terms of new acquisitions. But in my opinion, it is as important or perhaps more important for us to be able to source our requirements for sustenance, such as ammunition, your spares, and other requirements also indigenously. That is one part. Second is technology. Even if we were to import certain uh, weapon systems, from wherever we import this, you are not going to get the best technology. So you will always remain, as I say, one technology cycle behind. So hence, it is important for us to develop our own capabilities in terms of developing technologies, and hence the importance of the research and development. And I think in that direction, again, adequate emphasis uh, is being done. For a good defense industrial ecosystem to develop, I believe there are four essential parameters, four requirements. First, obviously, is the resource allocation. Second is the demand. Third is competition. And fourth is enabling policies and provisions. I think we need to address, and I again believe, good work is happening in all these directions. As to what we as services can do, I think we have taken a number of steps to promote Atmanirbharta in terms of having our own agency, which we call the Army Design Bureau, which is our point of contact, the nodal agency as an interface with the industry. We have regional technology nodes at important centers such as Pune, Bangalore, Hyderabad. We have Indian Army cells co-opted with institutes of academic excellence such as the IITs. We are hand-holding the defense industry in terms of facilitating visits of their representative to forward areas, uh, facilitating trials and testing of their equipment systems, and the likes. Uh, we are also looking at spiral development and fo uh, following different parallel routes of development in terms of what the industry can do. I think the good news is that the Indian defense industry, in my opinion, is is stepping up to the challenge. I think they have invested or they are investing in research and development into modern production and manufacturing techniques. And in terms of, if I were to give you some numbers, I think we have about close to 340 industries which are currently working at something like 230 contracts. And by 2025, if you do the bean count, these amount to about two lakh crores. So this is the kind of potential that has. We also need to look at as to how do you tap the innovation potential in the country. We have a very vibrant startup ecosystem. So that is another area in terms of innovation, in terms of the young, bright minds. How do we engage with them? How do you collaborate with them to address our technology requirements? In terms of ammunition, uh, we have about 174 ammunition categories. About 130 of them we do produce indigenously. We are focusing on the rest. So there is good progress happening with private industries also setting up manufacturing uh, plants for ammunition in different uh, parts of the country. So overall, I find uh, there is enthusiasm, there is good traction. What we need to be careful is while we focus on Atmanirbharta, there are no capability voids or there are no capability gaps in terms of our war fighting potential and that is, what, that is the key which we are looking at. Well said, uh, clearly India is setting its own benchmarks and its own milestones. But uh, General Ma Manoj Pandey, let me come down to the crux of the issue and I am sure you have been asked this question several times. After Galwan, the topmost question in everybody's mind is how prepared are 
we along our northern borders to face chinese threats and challenges we've had several rounds of talks what is the progress made in those is there really something to talk about at the moment uh, that's how lay people uh, would be asking questions and uh, just just how safe are we from chinese threats right so if first part of your question how well are we prepared i think we are prepared in every manner our levels of operational readiness operational preparedness is of a very high order in terms of our deployments along the entire length of 3488 kilometers of our borders i would say is both robust as well as balanced elements of uh, you know what the military has be it the artillery be it the tanks be it the infantry and the likes we also have made sure that we have adequate reserves uh, to be able to deal with any contingencies that may arise and these are the contingencies that we keep war gaming from time to time so we have our response mechanism uh, firmly in place in terms of what is the progress of talks uh, as you are aware we have talks at two levels one is at the military level at the level of our core commanders we have had 21 rounds on talks and then you have another level that is a diplomatic level where you have the mechanism of wmcc we've had so far 14 rounds of wmcc talks post the events of uh, mid 2020 it is my belief that it is only through talks that you will find resolution to the balance issues that are currently at hand now while these talks are progressing and i may not i would not want to go into the specifics because that may not be that relevant here but while we are engaging in talks we are also focusing on capability development along our northern borders of which technology infusion modernization is an important part the re- very recently the government gave us provisions to the service at quarter to procure certain equipment or war fighting systems uh, to meet the immediate requirements we have been able to put that to good use we are also focusing on infrastructure development which again i believe uh, we are moving in the right direction so to sum up i think our preparedness levels are of very high order and we are maintaining a very close watch on the developments uh, and what's happening across the world general saab uh, you are an experienced man on giving uh, uh, questions uh, and uh, you know answers to questions uh, in a very calibrated manner well i'm also an old news hound so i'll ask you the same question in a different format and i'll ask you on a scale of 1 to 10 what is your threat perception from china i think a more appropriate question would be on a scale of 1 is to 10s what is your preparedness level and the, my answer is that 10. you've answered so you are 100% prepared well, there i have no questions but 1 to 10 threat perception as uh, how how would you look at it in a practical manner well i think uh, you know from time to time we keep reviewing threats it depends on what time of the year at purely at the tactical level so threat during winter months may be slightly different than what it is during summer months so it may not be fair for me to quantify uh, but just as uh, our western adversary with respect to our northern adversary i'll uh, only like to say that our preparedness levels are on a very high order okay well so let me then ask you uh, on yes big round of applause uh, ladies and gentlemen <laughs> uh because uh, all of us sitting here in the audience uh, fem- feel extremely extremely positive and confident uh that uh, so long as the indian army is there uh, we have nothing to worry about and uh that is the trust level and that is the preparedness level assurance that you give to the people of this country let me also ask you about uh, domestically there are many states where you play a role jammu and kashmir manipur some of the northeastern states let me begin with manipur in recent times we've seen a turbulent uh, 
sequence of events in Manipur. How do you look at the situation prevailing there and what are the challenges and how are you meeting them? I think before I come to answering this question, I must uh, mention to the audience here that post the incident that happened in Manipur on the 9th, on 3rd, 4th of May, I think it was our proactive deployment, induction of additional forces there that we were able to control the violence uh, levels to a very large extent. And ever since, our soldiers, be it the Assam Rifles, be it the Army units who are deployed there, uh, I would say have given an excellent account of themselves. There are challenging operational conditions, uh, but in terms of preventing any collateral damage to non-military or civilian population, in terms of ensuring their own safety and protection, uh, I would believe they have done an excellent job. So what are the current challenges and what is the way forward? If I were to list out first the challenges, I think uh, the aspect of weapons which are currently uh, you know, still available at large, out of the close to 6,000 uh, weapons which have gone missing, we have been able to recover about 1,800. So there is a fairly large number of weapons which is still available, and that is a cause of concern. Uh, there is also the issue of activities that is happening across the Indo-Myanmar border. And with these kind of weapons available, uh, that remains a challenge. Second uh, is to get both the communities together. I think in that direction also, a uh, lot of work, a lot of initiative, a lot, lot of efforts that are happening, but we'll have to again move forward in that way. What I want to mention is that the situation there transcends just a law and order situation or a law order domain. We'll have to come up with a very comprehensive and a detailed framework to be able to find an answer to the uh, ongoing issues there. I would also highlight as to what is it that we are doing. Uh, we have a large ex-servicemen population in Manipur. So we, are, we have asked them to engage with the local community, take the lead. Our units there are helping the internally displaced people in the various relief camps. And I have asked my unit soldiers to remain extremely professional and do not and not to get caught in any of the sort of ongoing issues that are happening, which I think to their credit, they have done an excellent uh, job there. And uh, do you think we are uh, close to a stable situation or uh, do you think there are uh, still miles to go? Well, I, like I said, it's a process. I think we'll have to do the right things. Uh, in a good, uh, you know, in, in the near future. And there are a number of things we'll have to do. We'll have to address issues in terms of building trust between both the communities. There are issues which we'll have to address purely in the realms of security in terms of how our uh, security forces operate there and likewise. So it's a mix. Like I said, it has to be a comprehensive, multi-dimensional approach for us to find a good solution and get back uh, normalcy in that area. Well said. Uh, let, me, let me then uh, take you also to Jammu and Kashmir. How are we looking at the situation, especially uh, in the light of the forthcoming elections? Because uh, uh, fishing in troubled waters is what our Western neighbor has uh, very often used as a matter of strategy. Terrorist activities, our responses to it, uh, likelihood of uh, any increase in threat uh, perception from this uh, terrorist activity, especially in election times, uh, abrogation of Article 370, and since then, uh, the way the situation has unfolded, how do you see uh, the entire scenario in Jammu and Kashmir? So, uh, army formations were deployed in Jammu and Kashmir, both in the hinterland, as well as along the line of control in a counter-infiltration posture or counter-infiltration grid. 
I think we are working closely with the civil administration. We are closely working with other security agencies, other security forces, Central Armed Police Forces, as well as the JK Police. And that is the kind of synergy, that is the kind of coordination uh, in which we are working, which I believe is extremely important and is the key. In terms of infiltration, there are attempts at infiltration which are continuing both in the Valley region as well as to the south of the Pir Panjal region. But again, we have a very robust and an effective counter-infiltration grid, uh, which I think uh, has proven successful. In the hinterland, while there are uh, cases or instances of violence, but I think it is more out of our adversaries having recalibrated their proxy war strategies in terms of making people believe that it is a locally sort of generated or locally created insurgency. So we are keeping a close watch. I think our deployments are robust. We have a dynamic grid uh, of deployment there. So based on requirement uh, and based on the situation, we do recalibrate, realign our counterterrorism grid. Do you anticipate uh, any trouble during elections? Well, in terms of any incidents that may happen, we keep getting inputs of different kind. But uh, I think the intelligence agencies, the state administration, and all the security forces that are operating there, I think we are capable and, and to ensure an incident-free sort of operational environment so that the elections uh, happen in a peaceful environment. Uh, let, me, let me also ask you about uh, one of uh, your schemes that often makes headlines, especially with opposition parties, uh, which is the Agnivir scheme. Uh, it, it remains in the headlines for all the wrong reasons, uh, and, and uh, the opposition has only one view of it, that it is uh, creating um, you know, a new line of cannon fodder uh, for the enemy state, and they uh, are not covered uh, as other soldiers are, uh, and, and uh, actually becoming cannon fodder uh, without even getting the protection uh, materially or uh, uh, training-wise, or even, uh, you know, if they were to attain martyrdom. Let me start by saying that this Agni Path or Agni Veer scheme of human resource management was a transformational change or a transformational reform that we undertook in the past so many years. The advantages, the benefits that accrue out of the scheme, I need not mention or repeat here because I think that is something which is well known. After certain initial misgivings, apprehensions, which in my opinion uh, arose out of lack of full information or in some cases perhaps misinformation, I think all those are put to rest. Uh, as to how the scheme or how the Agnivirs are doing, the feedback that I get from our units, formations, and when I visit them, when I interact with them, uh, it is extremely encouraging, it is extremely positive. Within the military, uh, the leaders at all levels, right from the platoon commander, right up to divisional commander and above, uh, everybody has taken ownership of this scheme. And again, we are doing everything possible to make sure uh, that things happen in the right manner at the right time. There are certain changes, certain issues, because this is something new. So there is no rear view mirror for us to look at. So there are certain changes, certain lessons that we are learning as you are proceeding forward. And we are implementing or incorporating those modification changes in the system. In terms of concerns with respect to what you just highlighted, we are also making sure that when the Agni wheels at the end of four years move out, they carry a unique resume. Not only what they have imbibed out of the army or the military, but also they carry the skill sets. So we have worked alongside the NCVT, the National Skill Development Council, to make sure that whatever training they have undergone in the four years, they are adequately equipped. So my belief is, with this kind of a, uh, qualification, 
at the end of the four years with the kind of seva nidhi or the money that they will get, I think uh, there is good potential for them to pursue whatever they wish to do. Not only that, even for the industry, I think there is good, I believe this is a good source of youth who are well-trained, motivated, and I find uh, they will have uh, good demand once they move out. We are also looking at uh, lateral absorption of the Agnivirs post their exit after four years in different government department agencies. And as you would know, uh, again, there's lots which has happened. We are working in that direction uh, more. So uh, I think the cynicism with respect to what will happen once they moved out after four years, in my opinion, is misplaced. General Pandey, uh, before I let you go, I cannot but hold a session without asking about Nari Shakti forming in the Indian Army. How do you look at the role of women in uh, combat roles, uh, even in the newest Agnivir scheme? How do you look at their participation and how uh, is Nari Shakti in Indian Army actually performing? Very briefly, we were the first one to have women come into our forces. We currently have uh, women amongst our uh, forces in 12 armed public services. We have women who have given excellent account of themselves, not only in adventure sports and other activities, but you would recall even they are deployed in difficult areas such as the Siachen Glacier, etc. Uh, we have close to 128 women officers who are now donning the rank of a colonel and they are commanding officers. Commanding officers, <laughs> commanding units, and each unit is about 800 to 1,000 soldiers. Again, in extremely difficult areas of Leh, Ladakh, Jammu and Kashmir and the Northeast. So I think we have women in the UN assignments. We have sent them with our contingents to be part of the UN peacekeeping force. So every in every which way and in every sphere of activity, I think the women officers as well as women soldiers have proven themselves and uh, they are prepared to take on additional responsibilities as they move forward in the, uh, or they progress in their professional careers. Well said, General uh, Manoj Pandey, ladies and gentlemen, three cheers uh, to the Indian Army. And uh, of course, we cannot but say three cheers to Nari Shakti. General Pani, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you and uh, your uh, complete frankness in shedding light on so many questions and so many areas uh, which we as civilians needed answers for. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you for once again for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.